In the early 1970s, a monstrous serial killer lurked in Houston, Texas. Using two teenaged accomplices to lure his victims, he killed at least 28 young boys after subjecting them to horrific torture. The ordeal could sometimes last for days. Dean Coral, the Candyman. Dean Coral was born on December 24, 1939 in Fort Wayne, Indiana. His father was a disciplinarian while his mother was protective of him and his younger brother. After years of arguments, Coral's parents divorced in 1946. Still, Dean's mother relocated to Memphis, Tennessee so that the children could be close to their father who was stationed there with the Air Force. As a child, Dean Coral was a bit of a loner and did not socialize with other kids. In 1950, Coral's parents reunited briefly and moved the family to a suburb of Houston, Texas. But in 1953, there was a second divorce. Dean's mother soon married a traveling salesman named Jake West and moved to a small Texas town called Vidor. The couple had a daughter, Dean's half-sister, in 1955. The newlyweds also opened a candy company. In this candy company, Dean and his brother would make and package the candy while their stepfather sold it along his normal sales routes. After graduating from high school, Dean and his family moved to the Houston suburbs. The relocation was due partially to the fact that this area was where they sold a significant portion of their candy. They also opened a storefront called the Pecan Prince, which was the name of their top selling product. In 1960, Dean was sent by his mother to Indiana to live with his grandmother. During his time in Indiana, Coral spent time with a young woman who proposed to him in 1962. After refusing her, he moved back to the Houston area to rejoin the family candy business. At this point, the candy shop was in Houston Heights and Coral lived in an apartment above it. A year later, his mother divorced his stepfather and created her own candy company, calling it Coral Candy. Dean was made vice president and his younger brother was made treasurer. Also in 1963, one of the employees at the candy company complained to Dean's mother about him. A teenage boy said that Dean had approached him for sex, and instead of confronting her son, Dean's mother fired the employee. In 1964, Dean was drafted into the U.S. military. He was trained as a radio repairman, but his time in the service was brief. He would later tell friends that he had first realized he was interested in men while he was in the army, and had also had his first homosexual experience during that time. After less than a year, Coral applied for early release from the military because he said he was needed in his family business. His request was granted, and when he was back in Houston, his acquaintances said he was different. They had no idea what was about to happen. In 1965, the Coral Candy Company moved to a location across the street from Helms Elementary School. Dean gained a reputation for giving free candy to the kids in the neighborhood with special attention to the teenage boys. This was when he was given the nickname Candyman. He was seen regularly flirting with the boys and at a pool table in the back of the candy factory where his employees and local boys would gather. David Brooks came into the picture in 1967. He was 12 years old and became one of the regulars among the boys who hung out at the candy factory. Dean also took trips to South Texas to visit the beaches and would take the boys with him, including Brooks, who had begun to see him as a father figure. This bizarre relationship soon deteriorated into sexual transactions with Coral paying Brooks to perform sex acts on him. When Brooks dropped out of high school at age 15 in 1970, he moved with his mother to a town a little over an hour from Houston. When he came back to visit his father, Brooks would often stay overnight with Dean and had become emotionally dependent on him. By this time, Coral's mother and half-sister had moved to Colorado and the candy company had been closed down, which forced Dean to get a job as an electrician. 1970 was also the year that Dean killed his first known victim. 18-year-old Jeffrey Conan was hitchhiking in September of that year when he was abducted. His body was later found buried on High Island Beach. Around this time, David Brooks also walked in on Dean abusing two boys who were strapped naked to boards similar to what police would later discover. He bought Brooks silence by buying him a Corvette and also offered cash for any boys that he could bring to Coral's house. The first victims, which Brooks brought to the monster's house on December 13th, were 14-year-old James Glass and 15-year-old David Yates. They had been attending a church gathering when Brooks approached them and convinced them to go with him to Coral's house. They were tortured and murdered before being buried in a boat shed owned by Dean. 
A month later, on January 30th, 1971, two brothers were snatched off the street as they walked to a bowling alley. Donald Waldrop was 15 and his brother Jerry was 13 when they crossed paths with the creature. The boys were strangled and buried in the boat shed. Randall Harvey was a 15-year-old walking home from his job at a gas station when he disappeared on March 9, 1971. He was assaulted and shot before he was buried in the boat shed. His body was not identified until 2008. 13-year-old David Hillegeist and his friend, 16-year-old Gregory Winkle, were last seen climbing into a white van on May 29th. They were on their way to a swimming pool when they were abducted. Incidentally, they were also close friends with a 15-year-old named Elmer Wayne Henley, who helped their parents distribute missing persons flyers. Elmer would soon become entangled in the murderous schemes of Coral. In August, on the 17th, David Brooks and Dean came across a friend of David's named Reuben Watson as he walked home from a movie theater. Brooks told him that they were having a party at Coral's apartment and the 17-year-old joined them. When they had him in the apartment, he was tortured and strangled before he was buried in the boat shed with the others. In late 1971, Brooks brought his friend Elmer Wayne Henley to meet Dean. While he was likely a prospective victim, Coral saw Henley as an opportunity to gain a second person to lure boys to his house. He tested the 15-year-old by telling him to knock out David Brooks. After he did so, Coral raped Brooks and left him to recover tied up to his bed. After seeing that Henley was willing to assist him in his depraved acts of violence, Dean offered him the same $200 per boy that he had promised David Brooks. He explained that he would sell them on to a sex slavery ring that operated in the area. Elmer Wayne Henley would soon participate in not only the abductions, but also the murders committed by the monster. The next victim was a 17-year-old named Willard Branch. He was taken to Dean's home, raped, castrated, and shot. The teenager's father was a police officer, and he became so distraught during the search for his son that he died of a heart attack. The remains of Willard Branch were not identified until 1985. In March 1972, 18-year-old Frank Aguirre was snatched off the street by the trio. He was abused by Coral before he was shot. Instead of the boat shed, Aguirre was buried at High Island Beach. At the time of the murder, he had been engaged to marry a 14-year-old named Rhonda Williams. Rhonda would later play an integral role in the downfall of Dean Coral. On April 20th, a friend of both Brooks and Henley named Mark Scott was kidnapped. The 17-year-old was strangled and buried at the High Island Beach, according to Henley, but his remains have never been found. Dean was thirsting for another double murder in May, and on the 21st, he got his wish. 16-year-old Johnny DeLone and 17-year-old Billy Bouch were walking to a store in town when they went missing. Billy had been an employee of the Coral Candy Company in prior years. They were taken to Dean's apartment where he assaulted them for several hours before Elmer Wayne Henley shot them both. Henley would later claim that he had fired the gun up Johnny's nostril to kill him. The two were buried at High Island Beach. There was a brief pause before the next known victims were killed. On October 3rd, 14-year-old Wally Simino and his friend, 13-year-old Richard Hembry, were last seen talking to someone in a white van outside a grocery store in Houston Heights. Wally attempted to call his mother from Dean's home, but the phone was disconnected before he could tell her where he was. They were given paint to sniff under the pretext of a drug party until they were unconscious. Once they were out, Dean dragged them into his bedroom where he strapped them to the torture boards he had constructed and got to work. Brooks claimed they were abused for days before Wally was eventually strangled and Richard was shot and then strangled and the two were buried in the boat shed. In November, a 19-year-old named Richard Kempner went missing on his way to use a payphone. He was kidnapped, murdered, and then buried on High Island Beach. His remains were finally identified in 1983. Two months later, 17-year-old Joseph Lyles was abducted on February 1st. The 17-year-old lived a few houses down from David Brooks's father. Brooks would later tell police that Dean himself had grabbed him off the street. He was murdered and buried at Jefferson County Beach. 15-year-old Billy Lawrence was lured to Coral's house to attend a party by Henley and Brooks. He told his parents that he was going fishing with friends. Instead, he was tortured for days by Coral before being killed, then buried by the Sam Rayburn Reservoir. Eleven days after Billy Lawrence was murdered, the oldest of Dean's victims fell prey to the twisted monster on June 15th. 
Ray Blackburn was a 20-year-old man from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, who was hitchhiking in the Houston Heights area on his way to visit his newborn baby. He was strangled at Coral's home and also buried at Sam Rayburn Reservoir. July would be a bloody month. On the 7th, a 15-year-old named Homer Garcia was murdered. He had been a classmate of Henley at a driving school. He was tortured and raped before being shot in the head and chest and buried at Sam Rayburn Reservoir. On July 12th, a 17-year-old named John Sellers was abducted and murdered. He was abducted and shot four times and was the only victim to be buried fully dressed. When Elmer Wayne Henley went to trial, there was a question as to whether Sellers was actually a victim of Coral. The gun that had been used to kill him was a rifle, different from the pistol rounds used in the other murders. However, the two accomplices were able to lead police to his grave on High Island Beach, and he had been bound in a similar manner as the other victims. A brother of one of Coral's previous victims was abducted and killed around July 19th. Michael Bouch was 15 when he fell into the clutches of the Candyman. He was subjected to what had become a routine of torture and murder by Dean and his young acolytes and was buried at Sam Rayburn Reservoir. On the 25th of July, Coral claimed another two victims simultaneously. 17-year-old Charles Cobble and 18-year-old Marty Jones were last seen walking together with Elmer Wayne Henley, who they knew from school. They were headed in the direction of Dean's apartment. Their remains were found buried in the boat shed, and both had been shot in the head. The last known victim of the trio was 13-year-old James Drymala. He had been last seen riding his bike in South Houston on August 3rd. That evening, he called his parents to tell them he was at a party with friends, and to this day, his remains have not been found. On August 8th, it all came crashing down on Dean Coral, and one of the monsters he had created would turn on him. On August 8, 1973, Elmer Wayne Henley lured a 19-year-old named Timothy Curley to Dean's home. They got high and drunk, and then around midnight, they headed out to get some food. On their way back from eating, Henley stopped the car when he saw a friend of theirs, Rhonda Williams. Her father was drunk and had become violent, so she wanted to be away from him until he sobered up. Henley invited her to join them at Coral's party. When they walked in the front door and Dean saw the three of them, he exploded. He took Henley aside and was furious that he had brought a female to his home. After Henley explained the family situation that Rhonda was in, Coral seemed to calm down and proceeded to provide the youth with alcohol and drugs. When Henley woke up hours later, he was bound and gagged along with Timothy Curley and Rhonda Williams. Coral explained how he was going to torture, molest, and murder all three of them. And as he spoke, he kicked Curley repeatedly. When he pulled out the 22 pistol that they had used to murder the other victims, Henley convinced Dean that he would help him abuse Curly and Williams. Coral untied him and handed him a large knife, instructing him to assault Rondo while he assaulted Curly. The other two were starting to come out of the stupor they had been in. Henley would later report that Williams asked him if what was going on was for real and if he would do anything about it. A moment later, Henley snatched the pistol and pointed it at Dean. As the monster lurched toward him, Henley shot him three times as Coral shouted, Kill me, Wayne! After the first three shots, Dean tried to stumble away and Wayne shot him three more times. Once the depraved murderer was incapacitated, Henley untied the other two teenagers. Curly insisted that they call police despite Wayne saying they should simply leave the scene. At 8.24 a.m., Elmer Wayne Henley called 911. When police arrived, the three teenagers were sitting outside the house. The pistol was laying in the driveway. Curly would later tell authorities that Henley had told him that he could have gotten $200 for him. The police could not have been prepared for the confession that Henley gave them when they arrived at the police station. Elmer Wayne Henley explained to police how he and David Brooks had spent the previous years luring other boys to Dean Coral's house to be raped and murdered. Many of the boys were their friends and neighbors. He also told the police about the boat shed where many of the victims had been buried as well as the bodies at Sam Rayburn Reservoir and those buried at High Island Beach. Police did not immediately believe Henley until he named three boys who were missing. Reinforcing his admission was the torture board they found in Dean Coral's home. They also found wooden boxes which had human hair inside, suggesting that they had been used to store his captives. At this point, they were willing to dig at the boat shed that Henley had told them about. Police went to the shed the next day on August 8, 1973. Inside the shed, they found a stolen car and a box of boys' clothing collected from Dean's victims. After a cursory examination, they began to dig and almost immediately began finding bodies. 
During one of the initial searches, Elmer Wayne Henley called his mother to tell her what had happened. Who? Mama. Who's this? It's Wayne. Yes, this is Mama, baby. Mama? Yeah. I killed Dean. Wayne? Ma'am? Oh, what are you doing? Yes, yes, Oh, God. Where are you? Um, it's all right. Wayne? It's all right. It's all right. Where are you? I'm, I'm out of his warehouse. Where? Out of that warehouse, he keeps. <laughs> Can I come out there? Yeah, yes. No. Is a man Clark? She can't. No, you can't come. I'm, I'm with the police, Mama. The body showed evidence of horrific abuse. They had all been raped and subjected to various tortures. Some had been chewed on, while others had glass rods inserted into them and then smashed. But they all were gagged and bound. On that first day, the police dug up eight bodies. Also on August 8th, David Brooks turned himself into police. His story was that he had seen Dean Coral raping two boys, but that he had never known about any of the murders. However, Henley was leading police to other burial sites and they continued to unearth victims. By the time police were satisfied that they had found all the bodies that were in the three locations that Henley had showed them, 27 bodies had been found. An additional victim was discovered on a beach in Jefferson County in 1983. This was Joseph Lyle's body. Police stopped digging after they found the 27 bodies. Some in the community were critical of this at the time since many more boys had gone missing from Houston in the years that Coral had been active. Additionally, there were long pauses between the known murders and only those committed with Henley had been detailed to police. There is no way of knowing how many he killed. Elmer Wayne Henley went to trial in July of 1974. He was charged with six of the murders committed with Dean Coral. It was a tense trial and the audience was emotional. After horrific testimonies from the medical examiners and surviving victims, Henley was sentenced to nearly 600 years in prison. Upon his appeal in June of 1979, this sentence was reaffirmed. David Brooks did not go to trial until late February in 1975, charged with four of the murders. He maintained the claim that he had not participated in any of the murders. This was treated with derision from the prosecution and his trial ended in less than a week and the decision for the jury took less than two hours to convict him. He was sentenced to life in prison and in May of 1979, he had his appeal dismissed. David Brooks died in 2020 in a Galveston prison hospital after contracting COVID in prison. He has spent 46 years inside. Elmer Wayne Henley is still alive and housed at Connolly Prison in Carnes County, Texas. Searches for additional bodies have been underway as recently as 2021. Though without assistance from Henley, it is unlikely that more victims will be found after so many years.